Welcome to the Investor Financing Podcast, where we interview real estate investors and lenders so you can learn all the secrets to getting your projects funded and scale your portfolio. Learn about fix and flip loans, burr financing, rental, fix to rent, commercial, multifamily bridge loans, business loans, and so much more. And now, your host, Bo Eckstein. Hello, everyone, and we are back for our webinar series with Bedford Lending and Kyle Jean. Um, and today, I thought it was very important to kind of compare why HUD versus agency um, because we get this question all the time, what is actually a good fit? So I want to shoot this. I think we'll probably go 20 minutes or so. It's mm -hmm. not going to be a long one, but it's just going to give you kind of the, uh, the basic overview of why you consider, should consider HUD and then why you would consider either bank or agency. So Kyle, why don't you kind of take it away? You can give a little bit of your background and the company history. Uh, sure, yeah, if we go to the next slide, I'll give a brief overview. Uh, if you've never heard of us, we are a direct HUD lender. We've been around for about 30 years. Uh, with HUD, you can finance multifamily and healthcare assets. So we can do ground up construction, you can do rehab, you can do perm only refis or acquisitions. So what you can do under HUD is a little bit more flexible than Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and to Bo's point, this video is going to provide kind of a, a top level overview. Uh, I think sometimes there is a question of what is HUD? How do I apply HUD to a particular asset? Does HUD mean I have to have affordable housing? So if you have an existing portfolio, you've never looked into HUD in the past, or if you're kind of getting into the multifamily space for the first time and not quite sure what the differences are, uh, this will be kind of a, a good general overview. And then if you have any particular questions, Bo and I are always available anytime to, uh, to answer those. So yeah, we lend nationwide. Uh, we've been doing it again for about 30 years. We've done over $2 billion in financing. And our difference is that we don't get paid until closing. So you know, we don't try to uh, take anybody's time or, or really waste anybody's time. We try to do a sizing of a deal very quickly. If you're not sure how HUD works, we have a lot of learning materials and handouts we can provide to you and make sure that you understand uh, every nuance of the program, all the pros, and honestly, all the cons so that you're making the best decision. You're not going and spending a month uh, on, on the HUD process or the Fannie or the Freddie process and ultimately learning that it's maybe not the best fit for you. We wanna make sure that uh, you understand all the different dynamics and, and, and pick the best choice for your, for your asset. So in the general program similarities, they all provide non-recourse financing for uh, multifamily assets. Uh, they provide cash out, they are assumable, they are available nationwide, uh, and they are general commercial real estate loans. So you're going to need an appraisal, you're going to need a property condition report. Uh, both HUD and Fannie or Freddie require uh, a minimum of five units, so if you're looking to do uh, single family homes or a two unit or a three unit or you know, scattered fourplexes all around, that's going to be more difficult, particularly with HUD. Uh, it's more economical at a larger size, but just a snow on, on, on a basic level, um, these programs are available nationwide for you. They are non-recourse. So there's no personal guarantee in the event of a default. Uh, the only way there's any sort of guarantee or recourse is if there's some sort of uh, you know, fraud or something negligent that's done. Uh, and you know they, they do provide quite a bit of flexibility versus your traditional conventional bank or, or credit union type of loan. So why HUD or why Freddie uh, and Fannie? We'll go into more detail on each one of these specific line items as we go through this video. But in general, HUD is higher leverage. It's got a longer loan term. It's, it's a longer amortization. The prepayment is generally a little bit simpler. Uh, and I think very important is the loan terms do not vary by market. So with Fannie and Freddie, again, we'll go into it in a little bit more detail, but the programs can change slightly depending upon if you're in a major metro area or a smaller area. That's not the case with HUD. It's, it's the same leverage across the board. Um, with HUD, you just have one essential program of which you could do um, you know, uh, a garden style apartment building or you could do all different fit and fit, finish and configurations. Whereas the agency products, the Fannie Freddie products, they're a little bit more compartmentalized. They have you know, a student housing and a small balance program and a standard program and this program. So there's more individual buckets with Fannie Freddie versus with HUD. Uh, typically HUD has lower interest rates. Uh, generally Fannie Freddie is based on the 10-year treasury. There's a spread. 
with HUD, typically it's, I'd say at least realistically, you know, 50 to 60 basis points below where Fannie and Freddie are, even when you factor in uh, the MIP, which is, is a requirement for HUD. And so there are a lot of similarities, but also some pretty specific differences that can be both a pro and a con, again, depending upon your, your particular scenario. So as mentioned, very important if you own a, a portfolio or different assets in a, a small area, let's say you're in a, a rural part of a state, a secondary market, a tertiary market, with Fannie or Freddie, they're going to classify you as a quote unquote top market or a standard market. And the leverage and program terms are going to change accordingly. Your debt coverage ratios will increase if you're in a, a tertiary market, your leverage will decrease. So you may start at 80% if you're in Manhattan. And if you're in rural Alabama, that may go down to 70 or 65%. HUD does not have that impact. Um, so you are a minimum of 85% leverage and a minimum debt coverage ratio of 1.17 versus the, the fluctuations that you see uh, with Fannie and Freddie. Uh, loan term differences. HUD is minimum 35 year fixed rate, non-recourse, it's fully amortizing. So when you lock in that interest rate prior to closing, that interest rate carries through for 35 years. There's no reset whatsoever. Uh, there's no second closing down the road. You don't have to get another appraisal down the road. It is just fixed and put to bed. So you can imagine if you're looking at an asset as a long-term hold, if you're putting something in a trust for your kids, having that interest rate as of today's recording in the twos uh, fixed for 35 years is, is very uh, appealing both from an investment perspective and also potentially appealing to an outside investor who may come in and buy the asset. All these HUD loans are assumable. So 10 years from now, if interest rates are four or five or 6% and you have a HUD loan of two and a half percent, that can add a, a lot of value uh, from a sales perspective. Unfortunately with HUD though, there is no interest only period available. So with Fannie Freddie, you can get a little bit more flexibility about building in uh, IO periods um, and the fixed portion of Fannie Freddie has a little bit of variability as well. You can do five or seven or 10 or 15 or 20 year. Typically it's a 30 year amortization. So if you are looking for that shorter midterm hold, they're a little bit more comparable. And that's where if it's a true shorter term hold, uh, Freddie and Fannie can become a little bit more economical because you don't have the soft costs up front. For HUD, you pay a little bit more in terms of your reports and different costs. But the benefit is once you pay it once, it's, it's locked in for 35 years. And we're, we're at kind of historically low rates. So, I mean, five years from now, rates probably won't be as low as they are right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, as of this recording, we should be okay for a year or two or who knows. It's tough to predict the future. But I agree with you in general. Um, I, I cannot imagine seeing interest rate. Right, right now, my personal mortgage, I have good credit. I have a, a, a mortgage at a 3.8% interest rate. And if I had a $50 million apartment building, I could refinance with HUD, pull cash out and get an interest rate at least 100 basis points below my single family residential mortgage. So where rates are right now with these HUD loans is, is kind of amazing. It's hard to wrap your mind around, really. All right. Uh, so prepayment differences. This is not quite as uh, applicable. Uh, typically, if you're going to get involved in HUD, you're not going to try to flip an asset in, in two or three years. Again, the HUD loan is assumable at any time. So somebody could come in and assume that debt and not be subject to a prepayment penalty. But if you are going to use HUD to take a property down, acquire it, refinance it, generally it's always a 10-year prepayment penalty, which is standard declining. It declines by 1% each year post-closing. So after closing, it's 10, then 9, then 8, then 7, then 6. There is uh, some flexibility or the ability to change that. You can reduce it down to five years or seven years. But anytime you change that prepayment structure, it's, uh, it has an impact on the overall interest rate. The investor uh, will, will essentially charge more by, by changing that prepayment. So it's another one of those things where if you're getting involved with HUD and you're willing to pay the soft costs up front, you want to try to maximize the benefits of that low interest rate and you don't want to, to change that structure. With Fannie and Freddie, they also provide a declining prepayment penalty, but sometimes you'll see yield maintenance or defeasance. 
which can be uh, a little bit more painful than a declining prepayment penalty. It can kind of stick with you a little bit further down the road in the event of a sale. We could probably do a whole other video on yield maintenance and defeasance, and there are calculators available as well. But just to know with HUD, it's pretty simple, 10-year declining. You have a little bit of flexibility to change that, but 99% of HUD deals that are closed, regardless of whether it's construction or refis or whatever, they all follow that same 10-year uh, declining structure. Okay. Uh, and broker flexibility, I, I mentioned this briefly uh, before, but with Vanny and Freddie, you have a lot of variability. You have an affordable housing program, you have a small balance program, you have specific types of programs for student housing and standard housing. You don't get that granularity with HUD. HUD has a what they call 223F, that is the actual program term. So after this video, if you Google HUD 223F, you can see different materials and we have PowerPoints and different, uh, uh, different handouts that are available. So the HUD 223F program, that is the big bucket that can do affordable housing. It can do market rate housing. It can do a combination. It could do tax credits. It could do cash out, no cash out. It could do a senior, 62 and older. Everything is funneled into that one bucket, which makes it a little bit easier to, to wrap your mind around. If you understand the HUD program and the terms and the benefits, it's generally applicable regardless of what type of asset you have or your unit complexion or your tenant mix. Whereas with Fannie and Freddie, because of that granularity, depending upon what you're looking to do in terms of a refinance or an acquisition, that can also impact your debt coverage and your leverage just depending upon what that asset is like. So it's a little bit simpler for HUD uh, once you understand all the different nuances. Uh, the biggest difference probably from a, a purely processing perspective or for somebody who's new to HUD is the impact of the soft costs. It's a natural trade-off with HUD. It's a 35-year term and that's it. It's one closing. So as you can imagine, the scrutiny put into uh, property condition and the, uh, the detail of an appraisal um, of an environmental report is higher and thus more costly than it is for a Fannie or Freddie option. I would say this is a, a big uh, item to consider if you're leveraging both. If you have that class C minus D asset, even a class C where you're not quite sure what that repair level would be if you're going for financing, both HUD, both Fannie, both Freddie are going to require a property condition report, but Fannie and Freddie, the scrutiny of the property will not be as intense as HUD due to that difference in loan term and leverage. And that's kind of across the board. Your appraisal costs more, your environmental costs more, your property condition report costs more. There are specific HUD fees that are involved as well, which we can provide a breakdown for later. Um, and also typically the lender, people in our position or any lender that you may talk to, the HUD loans uh, are considerably more complex from a processing and underwriting. So generally your lender is going to charge a higher percentage as well than a, a Fannie and Freddie shop would. And that depends upon loan size and variety of factors. But that's, that goes back to you know, how it's hard to do your four unit or your 10 unit or your smaller asset, um, you know, really not as economical to use HUD for very small loan sizes. Got it. But, okay, that makes sense. Um, what what can you kind of break it down? Just kind of a high level overview of 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 the differences that you know from a from a cost standpoint. Is it you know are the costs twenty percent higher than a or thirty percent higher? Like kind of yeah, a rule of thumb. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, realistically, it, it, it even the HUD specific fees vary pretty considerably depending upon let's say you have section eight housing, or let's say your property is energy efficient. There's a whole lot of different reasons of how the HUD fees could change. I would say in a worst case scenario, if you have vanilla market rate apartment building, you have no energy efficiency, no affordability, nothing, just your standard, you know, standard apartment building. With HUD, realistically, all your fees are probably gonna be, doing the math in my head, probably three to three and a half percent of the mortgage just as a, a round estimate. And with Fannie and Freddie, it's more of a simple lump sum. Typically when you get an LOI from a lender, they'll list whatever that cost is, which will cover legal site inspection, third parties. That could be 20,000, 30,000, maybe 40,000. So um, it depends, that, that percentage depends upon the overall size of the loan. But I would say with HUD, 
realistically, you're probably looking at maybe three times, if not more, the fees uh, versus a, a Fannie or Freddie option, realistically. That's good. That's good to kind of point out. All right. So construction takeout, this is something that if we had recorded this video two months ago or three months ago, this would have been a completely different discussion. I've been doing HUD stuff for over 10 years and HUD recently rolled out the largest change to the program that I've seen in that time. You can now use HUD, that 223F program that this video is covering, to refinance a recently constructed asset that was not constructed with HUD. So let's say you built an apartment building with a bank or a credit union or a life co or whoever, it used to be that three year moratorium with HUD, you could not come back to HUD for three years. You had to do interim financing or this or that. And that meant HUD really never touched recently constructed assets. You would go to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which are more flexible, and that was it. So that's changed. Once your property that you've built can sustain a certain debt coverage, the 1.17 here, based on the new loan under HUD, you can refinance with HUD. You can even take cash out. There's really no limitations whatsoever. We're doing that right now for a couple clients. They built with a bank. We're providing cash out. And because of the interest rates where they are with HUD, their cash out plus the payoff plus paying off a prepayment penalty with their bank is still saving them a significant amount of, uh, of money each year in terms of debt service payments. The only thing to note also with HUD, with Fannie Freddie, you can refinance at 90% occupancy for 90 days, and you can also take supplemental loans out. As that building is amortizing or the value is increasing, you can take out supplemental loans to keep pulling cash out as that value is increasing. With HUD, you can't do that. HUD has a supplemental loan program, but uh, it's not used for an equity takeout. So again, HUD is sort of that long-term approach. If you're gonna take out an asset with HUD, know that you can take your cash out up front but that's it. If you want to take cash out again, five or 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, you have to do a true formal new refinance process. And your interest rate at that time is going to be subject to whatever the market conditions are at that time. So both can refinance recently constructed assets. It really just depends upon, again, investment profile and, and what your goals are to, to see what the differences are. I have, I have two clients right now that, um, uh, you know, bought with bridge financing and are, you know, finishing the, uh, the turnover on the property. And, you know, I've already showed them our pre previous webinar and they're, they definitely want to size out with HUD. And, and what I like about work with you, Kyle, is that it's like, it's very simple, right? We just need, need a few things and you can size the loan for them. You can show them side by side here. It's, we're not really even selling, right? We're just giving them, here's the facts. Like if you go agency or you go HUD, this is, this is your proceeds, right? And yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all just dollars and cents, really. We, we, there's no smoke and mirrors in the stuff that we do. It's, you know, if you have an existing asset or a recently constructed asset, what are your rents? What are your expenses? And what's your payoff? And then it's just a matter of plugging it in and, and doing a comparison to say, okay, if Fannie Freddie is here and the costs are cheaper, but the leverage is lower, what makes sense for you? What's a simple cost benefit analysis? So yeah, we just use real figures. It's all subject to an appraisal down the road, but it, it's very easy for us to do a sizing, make sure that you understand line item by line item. Here are all the actual costs that you will incur. Here's a general assumption in terms of what type of debt you could qualify for. And we try to make it a, as turnkey as possible for you so that again, you're not going in uh, at any point in the process blind or not quite sure uh, what, what option is best for you. I mean, even on a, a cash out refinance or a refinance, you can go 80% um, mm -hmm. with HUD versus maybe 70 or 75 with agency. So, I mean. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So, so your proceeds, even with a little bit more cost, I mean, there's the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. 
Yeah, so the difference between the timing and interest rate, this is also another consideration. In addition to the soft costs that you have to pay with HUD, um, HUD typically takes longer. The two biggest misconceptions about HUD, which we touched on previously in our, our, our prior webinar, were you know, people think that HUD equals affordable housing. You have to have some sort of uh, rent restriction or Section 8 income or this or that. And that's not the case. With any HUD program, HUD multifamily financing, you could be 100% luxury market rate. You could get four or five bucks a foot for rent. It doesn't matter. There's no limitations whatsoever for HUD. As long as you can achieve it, that's fine. With the processing time, you hear these nightmarish scenarios of it takes you know two years to do or a year to do. The HUD refinance and acquisition, the 223F program that this video is about, is a one-step process. So you are dealing with the federal government. You are dealing with a certain amount of bureaucracy. There's no way around it. But it is not this horrific, labyrinthian, terrible process. What happens is we would start the process if the numbers make sense for you. We commission third-party reports, no different than a bank loan or credit, lo credit union loan or Fannie or Freddie. We get the appraisal back. We get the property condition report back. And then we submit to HUD, and that's it. It's all one stage. Fannie and Freddie, realistically, it is a faster process. You are looking at you know, I'd say 40 to 50 to maybe 70 to 80 days on the outset. It kind of depends upon a variety of factors. With HUD, realistically, you're at three to four months, maybe four months, depending upon, you know, right now we're in a strange time with COVID. So HUD can be tough if you have a hard drop dead date. Let's say you have a seller who wants to move a property and they're not willing to do any sort of extension. Well, there's really no guarantee from HUD, both from the federal government and from our side, that we can hit a specific date. But if you have even a little bit of flexibility, that three to four month time frame is is not uh, not as bad as a lot of people are expecting. It's really not that different from your Fannie Freddie options that are out there. Yeah, I was I was telling you I was listening to a webinar with a commercial mortgage broker. He does a lot of agency placement, mm -hmm. and even even mm -hmm. he had a misconception that it takes seven months on a purchase. You know, and so. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting as as I learn more and more through uh, your trainings is that um, people really don't understand HUD and, and the value value it brings. So it's it's when I'm introducing this to all these multifamily uh, owners I know, they're like, "Wow, how come nobody ever told me about this?" And yeah, yeah, and also you have a lot of people who may have experience with HUD like a while ago. All right, so we have a lot of people who say, "Oh yeah." I dealt with HUD 20 years ago when I didn't really like the process, or I dealt with HUD, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, or I know somebody who dealt with HUD and they didn't like it. And there have been a lot of changes since. Even over the past few years, there used to be a lot, over 50 offices around the country uh, that process these different HUD loans on behalf of the federal government. And that was consolidated down to about nine offices. You have some core offices and some satellite offices. So there have been a lot of efficiencies brought in place. There was an entirely new processing and underwriting guide that was published a few years ago, and there's a new one coming out shortly. So there have been a lot of uh, procedures put in place by HUD to try to make the process uh, much less painful than it has been maybe in the past. It's, it's, it's continues to get better and better and better. And also, you know, once you go through the HUD process once, that's where you can really truncate things down as well. Once you understand uh, what HUD is looking for, we'll guide you through and do all the paperwork as much as possible. But once you know what to expect uh, and have kind of the procedures in place from your end, from the sponsor end, then yeah, the, the whole process itself becomes pretty seamless. So uh, borrowers can b borrow multiple times potentially and not just like where yeah. SBA only allows typically one loan. Mm -hmm. the HUD programs, you could, you could be building, you know, multifamily properties. You could be acquiring existing buildings and mm -hmm. they don't really have a threshold that says we only lend you 30 million dollars which is great mm -hmm. yeah okay. yeah 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 with hud there's really truly no limitation i mean um if you wanted to do two or three investments or four or five or you know, we have some clients we've done we, they've literally done 12 13 plus hud loans with us so yeah as long as your assets are performing as long as you have you know, you're, you're, if you're at that stage, you should have a pretty decent net worth and be pretty credit worthy. And there's no arbitrary restriction from HUD where they limit you to a certain amount of loans or a certain amount of this or that. Uh, no, no limitations whatsoever. High cost areas. Is that popping up? Uh, yeah, it just popped up now. Um, yeah, so... Uh, with This is a, a more of an edge case, something that's not really going to be applicable for a variety of areas. 
and I could probably do a whole video on this as well, but if you're looking to do a loan in a high cost area like New York or California or something like that, HUD can have a lot of limitations. They will not lend past a certain value on a per unit basis. So um, let's say you wanted to do a refinance of a, an apartment building and your unit valuations were $400,000 or $500,000 per unit, which can occur in a place like California or uh, even places like Miami, obviously Manhattan, any of these major metro areas. HUD has limits on what they will lend on a per unit basis. Um, so that's something that we can factor in. We can provide different guidance to you. But Fannie and Freddie uh, do not really have those limitations. So if you're in those high cost areas, those high value areas, then that, that can provide a little bit more flexibility for you. Perfect. Uh, and liquidity net worth, this is another big differentiator as well. This could be a big stumbling block for people who are looking to get into agency financing. Uh, Fannie and Freddie have hard minimum requirements, hard net worth liquidity. Typically, they want a net worth equivalent to the loan amount, and they want uh, your liquidity to be equal to a certain amount of, uh, uh, of the debt service payments for a given amount of time. HUD doesn't have that. HUD has no, again, no line in the sand where you must have this or you must have that. They're looking for kind of a, a gut check. They're saying, okay, if you want to do a $5 million refinance with us and take cash out, you can't have $2 in the bank and have a credit score of 500. It's more just kind of a, a general feel of, is a borrower experienced? You know, are they generally credit worthy? Do they have a, a pretty good net worth position? Uh, if so, then they are an eligible borrower. Uh, they don't have to meet the, these more arbitrary thresholds. So this is something that in effect, when you start getting into that five, six, seven, eight million dollar uh, potential loan request, typically the people who are owning assets like that have a reasonable net worth and pretty good liquidity as well. But it's just important to note that if you've been discouraged by agency in the past needing to hit these, these certain thresholds that you just don't meet for whatever reason, it may be worth taking another look with HUD because they do not have those, those limitations. And, and if, um, let's say they're doing a, more of a syndication, um, is there a requirement if one of the LP, LP puts in a certain percentage or has a certain percentage of ownership, they would actually have to go on to the, into the application process? Yeah, typically, so with HUD, if you're syndicating capital, let's say you're, you're raising money from however, two, three, five, or 20 people, typically anybody who has more than 15 to 20% uh, ownership uh, is going to be subject to a credit review. But if we can treat somebody as a, a passive principal, somebody that's not going to have day-to-day -day control of the operation, they're just putting money in, they're looking for cash flow, and that's it, then they're not subject to any credit review. We don't need their tax returns. We don't need to pull credit on them. Um, we need to obviously identify at least one person, kind of the managing or active principal in the deal, uh, who's going to be the, the loan signatory and do our due diligence on them. But if you're going to be raising money from a variety of people, or even if you have friends and family or partners, uh, as long as they're below a certain threshold, as long as they are, again, that passive type of principal, uh, they're not subject to HUD credit review. So in conclusion, when to use HUD? HUD has economies of scale, as mentioned that three, three and a half percent of the loan in terms of the different soft costs involved. We don't really want to incur the cost of a HUD appraisal if it's the same price for an appraisal for a $1 million loan as it is for a $20 million loan. So I'd say realistically, anything over two, three, four million bucks is when the HUD 223F program starts to make sense. And you want at least a class C, ideally a class C plus B type property and above because of that scrutiny of the property condition. If you're in a more rural market, a tertiary market, something where um, you, know, you have a, a smaller type of population, that HUD leverage is not gonna change, so it can be very beneficial. Um, and if you're really looking for that long-term hold, if you want a long-term fixed rate, again, if you're putting it in a trust, you just don't wanna think about it, this is your, your key asset, your crown jewel, you wanna protect the cash flow, that's where HUD can be uh, objectively just the best choice. There's really no other option to get this type of, of leverage in long-term length uh, and, and interest rate all combined. When you would use the Fannie and Freddie is if you are requesting a smaller asset, let's say you have a, a five family, 10, 15, 20. If it's in a, a high cost area, your Manhattans, your LAs, your Bostons, your DCs. Um, if you need to close quickly, the Fannie Freddie program is faster, it's cheaper, it's a little bit more flexible in terms of what you can do with interest only type of structures um, and fixed rate periods. 
and, and if the property condition is in tough shape, if you're buying something that is in a bit of disrepair or, or struggling a little bit and needs some capital improvements, it could be much more economical to pursue the Fannie Freddie route than with HUD. So always a different trade-off, always a pro and con to both scenarios. As Bo mentioned earlier, when we do a sizing for HUD, it's very easy for us to use some of the general Fannie Freddie criteria and give you an idea of, okay, if here's what your loan looks like under HUD, here's what it looks like in a general sense under that, here's the difference in proceeds, here's the difference in cash out or equity that would be required, and then you can make the, the judgment call of, of what works best for your, for your scenario. That's perfect. Okay. And to get started, we just need a, a few pieces of information. So if you already own an asset, we would need financials, we would need uh, rent rolls. We can send you out a formal checklist of information of stuff that we would need, but it's no different than if you were going to a bank or a credit union to get pre-qualified and no different than the information that you would need for Fannie and Freddie if you've been through that route before. It's just uh, provide us with current financials, historical financials, you know, current occupancy levels. If you happen to have an old third-party report like an appraisal, that's helpful for us to review just so we can see pictures and information about year built and that type of thing. But uh, for us to do an initial sizing, it's very quick turnaround on our end. It's, it's very painless, very simple. And the information we need uh, is very, very painless and simple from your end as well. So we, we try to make everything as streamlined as possible. And, and also let's just touch on, um, you know, it, it, if they have a property, it's not like it's going to take three months to get a yes. I mean, they'll, they'll know within, you know, two to three weeks from getting the package in because they'll have the initial concept meeting with, with HUD. So that you'll know yeah. from then. I think a lot of people, they always ask, well, how long is it going to take? I think you'll know fairly quickly. Can you just touch on the concept meeting? Yeah. So, I mean, the first level of scrutiny is us. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, we've been doing this for 30 years. And because we don't get paid until closing, and because we work closely with every HUD office in the country for a long time, we know what they are looking for. And if there's any sort of of edge case or scenario where we're not quite sure, we'll just reach out to HUD ahead of time, talk to our contacts there, float a scenario by them and determine it. We do not want you to spend any time, most importantly, any money, if we are not confident in the request. To Bo's point, the very first step in the process, what's nice, before you spend any money on an appraisal, on an environmental report, before you spend any time, you're not going into some sort of vortex or black box where you're not quite sure what HUD's going to think of your loan until you spend a bunch of money and you spend a bunch of time. HUD has like a, a pre-loan committee to start the process. They call it a concept meeting. Uh, and all that is, is, is we put together about a 15, 20 page narrative. There's no charge from us. There's no charge from HUD. And then we have a conference call with the HUD office nearest to your transaction. And the conference call, you are on as well. You and your partners, um, whoever would like to be on. And it's just a very candid dialogue. There's no formal process. There's no like list of questions that have to be asked. It's just a discussion, discussion with HUD saying, here it is, here's what's being proposed. HUD, are there any red flags from your side that we should be aware of? We've never brought a deal to concept that has not been invited to move forward with HUD because again, we know pretty definitively what HUD is looking for and what HUD's not looking for. That whole process from start to finish, from the time we first look at a loan and size it and give you an idea of what it looks like under HUD, to getting that approval, if you will, from HUD at that constant meeting stage could take no more than two or three weeks. So that process is pretty expedited. Then from there, if everything looks good and you get the approval from HUD, that's when you can elect to spend money on the appraisal and the different third party reports. And then from there, we would just compile our submission to HUD, send it to HUD and prepare for closing. So all, all a pretty simple systematic process and, and inherently designed to protect uh, borrowers from, from serving any money unnecessarily without confidence that the deal is going to go through. And also, let's talk on this for a minute because I think it's important. A lot of the deals I've been bringing you, to you uh, that we've been sizing up have been kind of more of like a value add play where um, what they're that's not a good way to go for a value add play because you're, you're, you're not going to be able to get your money out of it, right? You're better, you're better to take these deals into some kind of bridge loan and then stabilize the property. Um, sure, we can finance it through HUD, but you're better off raising the value and then refinancing with HUD. Um, Cause I, I, you know, as, as we're going, I'm, I'm bringing a lot of these kind of C minus buildings, right. That are older, that, ha that need a little bit of heavy lifting, um, uh, CapEx. And I'm, and I'm finding that, you know, 
the point of doing this video is to, sh to tell people that, that a bridge loan in that circumstances would be much more beneficial. And we could definitely size it up like pro forma. If once you get up to this level and the occupancy is there and the, and the, yeah. it's turned over, you're looking at this on a refinance for proceeds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The HUD is really not, we get the question of, well, can I build capital improvements into a HUD loan and then reflect the as improved value in underwriting, which let's say theoretically, I want to buy a building for 5 million bucks. I'm going to put $500,000 in. Will HUD give me what essentially is hundred percent financing? Will they give me a, a $6 million loan based on those improvements? And and no, I mean, an appraiser may recognize a little, little bit of an adjustment in income depending upon the level of those repairs, but a lot of repairs, fixing up a bathroom or a kitchen isn't really adding value so much as protecting value because it makes the complex more marketable. So you have something that's been struggling with occupancy. Um, if you have something that needs money to go into it, yeah, HUD's probably not the best fit to use as an acquisition loan because we really can't reflect any of that value add. You're going to be limited based on the as is value. You're going to be paying the capital improvement costs above and beyond that. And then you're going to be subject to that 10 year prepayment penalty. So you're not really able to uh, quickly or easily recapitalize yourself down the road. So if you can use some sort of interim financing, something else um, to, to right the ship, stabilize the property, do whatever you have to do, then get a HUD loan quickly after that and even pull cash out at that time at that true as improved value, that's a much easier uh, and more beneficial complexion to borrowers than trying to go in with that class C minus property because it, it just doesn't really work work in your favor. And when, they, uh, when the engineering reports are done, just like in agency debt, there's a reserve requirement. Can you mm -hmm. talk about the difference between um, you know, what HUD would, would hold versus agency typically? Yeah, so that's the thing with HUD, we look out over a, a 20 year reserve schedule. So with HUD, you break down repairs into a couple different levels. They'll look at what are critical repairs, which would be a, a life safety issue, some sort of major, you know, if you have a staircase that's collapsing or something, that would be a critical repair. They have non-critical repairs, which is anything that has to be done within a year post-closing. So that could be your own at owner discretion if you want to build in a cost for paint or whatever, or it could be something that the property condition report is identifying. You need to replace uh, railings or a lighting fixture or some plumbing or this or that. The HUD reserve schedule, we can factor in a reserve deposit uh, as a, a mortgageable cost with HUD. So you have to form a replacement reserve account with HUD. And let's say you need to fund it with a, a $20,000 deposit. Well, that can actually be drawn from mortgage proceeds. It doesn't have to come from cash. Or if you have an asset that already has a reserve account, we can just transfer the reserve account to uh, the new replacement reserve account for HUD. Agency is typically a little bit lighter. Uh, the reserve schedule, their findings, what they'll do in terms of analyzing individual building components just does not have the, uh, the scrutiny that, that HUD may have. So HUD requires a minimum of 250 per unit per annum as, as a, a minimum threshold for reserves. And then that number can go up based upon just what that repair level is. And that also becomes subject to some discussion. If you can fund more of the reserve account, then you need less ongoing reserves. If you don't want to fund the reserve account up front, you can have higher ongoing reserves. You can take some repairs that may be identified as needing to be done, you know, four or five years from now on that schedule and do it up front. So you have lower ongoing reserves. There's, there's a variety of different ways that you can take a look at it, but yeah, generally just with HUD. So much, Kyle. And I'm just going to end it here too, is that the other thing that's important because a lot of, I have a lot of multi-family syndicators and, and there, uh, you should note that with HUD, you can only do two distributions. Um, so when mm -hmm. you're a lot of times in their PPMs, you know, they're do, used to doing quarterly distributions. So this is something you need to be aware, aware of up front. And so that's, mm -hmm. Another purpose of doing this video is that I want to share this information with the investors out there that are syndicating these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a big consideration is with HUD, they will limit your surplus cash to uh, uh, twice a year. Uh, they prefer to do it once a year, but they will allow twice a year. So yeah, HUD, HUD doesn't want you to basically be taking money out uh, you know, on a month-to-month -month basis or a quarterly basis. Um, if you need that type of flexibility, if this is your one asset, you're kind of living off the cash flow, that's where HUD may not be the best fit for you. Uh, HUD looks at it as everything, much like the cost and scrutiny of the property condition and the limitation of the surplus cash. 
it's all because it's a, a 35 year non-recourse note. So they want to do, don't want to do anything that may jeopardize their position over that 35 year period. And part of that is just being pretty conservative with any sort of, uh, of cash takeout uh, from surplus cash. So that, that's an important thing to consider. Um, and for people who are new to HUD, they may look at that and say, I, I really don't want to, to deal with that type of limitation. Uh, but if you're the borrower that, that doesn't have much of an impact for, then uh, it doesn't make too much, too much of a difference, to be honest. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Cal. I think we, we nailed it. We, we covered everything. We gave uh, everyone a good overview. So why they would consider HUD versus agency and mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate it again. And we'll see you on the next, next, next webinar. We'll do the construction and, and heavy rehab rehab. Oh uh, yeah. That sounds fun. All right. Thank you everybody for watching. All right. Thanks Kyle. Thanks for listening to the investor financing podcast for show notes and useful resources. Please visit investor financing podcast.com for questions or comments, email info at investor financing podcast.com. If you enjoy our show, please share it with your network until next time.